course, when one buys a piece of machinery like the Flying Scotsman and intends running it, especially non-stop to Scotland, one has to have somewhere to keep and maintain it. At the time, one had to look around with an eye to the future, and one found that Doncaster was one of the few locomotive depots left that could cope with this kind of work. It was near the family business, and of course the Flying Scotsman itself was built here, so back here she came. One simply pays the rent and all the bills, and British Railways do the rest. I'm lucky enough to have the services of a number of retired railwomen who keep her looking the way she should look. And I'm pretty certain the reason they do this is not because of the present day glamour attached to the Flying Scotsman, but the fact that they're able to recapture a way of life that they possibly grumbled about as young men, but which nevertheless became a part of living that they felt they had lost forever. You came to work. Uh, you had a snap tin, you were fucked up. You didn't know how long that snap was going to last you. I mean, you might be away as long as 16 hours on occasion. Many a time come home to a, a dried up dinner or a, a wife in a bad temper. I've seen my children at home, they said, hello, dad, are you going to work? No, I'm not. Oh, you'll be going to bed then. And that's the kind of thing you used to get. It was either all work and no pleasure or all work or all bed. That's, that's how it used to be. None of that nowadays, I don't suppose. Strange feeling now after well, I was working it out. It's about three and a half years really that this exercise first was mooted, and now that it's finally come to the morning, it's rather like um, I suppose a diver on the high board waiting to take the plunge. And uh, I really can't wait now to, to get on the footplate and get on with it. How much do you think we've got on there now? Nine and a half, nine and a half. We've got that, we'll be well away. Should be ample, all the way through. Yeah. Good. Well, we've got to do the remaining topping up before we move off. Right. In the old days, of course, when there were plenty of steam locomotives running everywhere, uh, there was no problem. The water was treated in advance. Now, you never know what sort of water you're going to get. So we treat our own in this way. These briquettes will fill in here, and gradually during the journey, these get dissolved into the water, and it ensures that you get uh, nice clean water in the boiler, and uh, it makes the boiler last a great deal longer, at least that's the theory anyway.
morning. Tom? I was concerned was to be allowed to have a go and it is an extraordinary thought I in my opinion anyway that on a great nationalized undertaking one can take out a private piece of machinery 45 years old and uh, hitch it onto a train of British Railways stock and take 300 people 400 miles on the on a weekday in the middle of all the other services uh, let's face it I mean this is a pretty sporting gesture on the part of the British Railways board in my opinion anyway. I'm not able to go on the run today, but I just wanted to come and see my dear old Ledger again to say how do and wish her good luck. Right away. My wife, for the very first time on this uh, flying Scotsman train, on the 1st of May 1928. And therefore, this journey is giving me the most tremendous thrill. But my wife didn't even know it was a non stop, and certainly not the first non stop run. And she was ensconced in another carriage, but an elderly, a more elderly lady who was supposed to be keeping an eye on her had booked her a seat in our compartment. Much to her disgust, she took her away from the very pleasant, youthful surroundings and brought her into our carriage where she was horrified to find we'd got a parson. And I was really rather coarse about this and I said in French, to 
two man's old liqueur. Very sad to bring me in here when I was having such a lovely time in the other end, you know. And, um, my, and, and making me sit next to a parson and making me behave myself for the rest of the journey. And um, he, uh, he, he just turned round and answered in perfect French. And I was really completely shattered about this. However, he was extremely nice. And um, he, um, he gave us a wedding present, I remember. So he, he wasn't too cross with me in the end. There were only the four of us there. And everybody was carefully matey and excited about this. And we were being greeted on the way by waving crowds with flags and banners and all the town bands were turning out everybody on the train we got most tremendously friendly a terrific excitement a sense of occasion and uh, so naturally when the time came for lunch i suggested to my new friend molly payne as she was then uh, what about coming to have a spot of lunch with me? And she was very young in those days and very shy, as indeed she still is, and um, would not accept my invitation to go and have lunch with her in the dining car. However, the parson made it all right and he said, well, perhaps you may allow me to invite you both and then that will be all very seemly and proper. In those days, one bothered about such things. And we went to lunch, and during the rest of the journey, we got on like a house on fire, and we were engaged within three weeks' time. And so I was let in for 40 years' hard labor. Well, I think that it was 40 years' hard for me, not for you, anyway. <laughs> some people, me certainly, and to other people it's perfectly horrible. I mean, it's uh, the smell, the familiar smell of smoke and the beat of the engine and the feeling that you're being pulled not by a mechanical box on wheels but by something pulsing and alive. It's an aesthetic experience, it's a good railway journey by a steam train. A good journey by an electric train is a nice experience. And uh, any journey by train, as long as you can't smell diesel exhausts too much, but a good journey by steam, it's, it's a realized work of art. Quite a load, but vitally important still. 
the railway services in this country have been cut back more and more and to be able to show that a good old steam train can still do it I think will make us very proud, everybody on this train very proud. spent 47 years on the railways yes. and uh, it's a big change from my days to what it is today and uh, I'll, that's what I've come for today because I think I'm approaching 80 and I think it'll be uh, last time I shall see a steam engine. one of the typical sort of dodgy things that you can't legislate for. Apparently a broken rail being replaced and uh, nothing you can do about it. We go literally down to walking pace, but quite literally the wheels did just keep turning so we can still honestly say we haven't stopped. But it's a damn sight too near for comfort.
ground. And quite naturally, the interest transferred itself to my son. And when he was ill you know, with measles at the age of three, the mo it was most natural for me to tell him stories about trains. And is it Daddy? What was the engine? What are the engines' names? <laughs> and uh, I invented names on the spur of the moment: Edward, Gordon, Henry, and so on. There was. Edward's Day Out, uh, Henry in the Tunnel, and then there was another story based on the story I'd read in the magazine about a Highland Railway banker being left behind. This was the story of how Gordon got stuck on the hill and had to be rescued by Edward, the engine whom he despised, banking him in the rear. But once Edward had started him off, Gordon was able to go on fast, and poor Edward ran out of steam and got left behind. And so there it was. And the first book, Three Railway Engines, was published in 1945. You know, we, we too, Audrey, we, we rather remind me of two of your engine characters talking. And, uh, oh, for that matter, what about Bret Hart's thing? Let's wind up with him. Uh, that was what the engines said, unreported and unread, spoken slightly through the nose with a whistle of the clothes. Doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should be done in an American accent, though, which I didn't want to About three years ago, I started collecting the numbers or simply then for something to do while I was watching the trains. But then I sort of got hooked on it and, well, when getting near to completing a class, well, you want to carry on and try and complete it.
Tied it up to? Yeah. Right, Dodger. This is the highly dodgy situation that I hoped we were not going to find ourselves in, that we are now in. Uh, we've had two rather poor pickups of water, and only one good one out of three. And it's really a question now as to whether to take the water that we have got laid on in reserve at Berry-Con-Tweed, or whether to take a calculated risk, I suppose is the term, and carry on beyond the point of no return and try and make Edinburgh. Now, this sort of decision is not mine. I'm not a professional railwoman. I'm merely an enthusiast. And obviously, my inclination would be to press on and have a go. But the people who carry the can, if anything does go wrong on this, are really the chief motive power inspector and his number one. That's to say, there's Richards and George Harlan, and they're having a conference up on the entrance at the moment. And that's why I've come back into the train so that I don't in any way influence them. We shall know within a matter of minutes now whether we're going to do any more. where we could have got some emergency water was there at Berwick-on-Tweed and by being switched around the little goods loop we were right alongside a road tanker that had 4,000 gallons of water in it. I don't know how much we've got on board but my guess would be with the mileage we've got to do we've probably got about two and a half to three thousand gallons. I, I don't know. You looked very cool when we, were, when we nearly came to a stop outside Berwick. Well, I think it must it's, have been a very emotional it, moment. It's it absolutely fatal to do this sort of exercises if one's going to do one's nut every time anything goes wrong. Because, I mean, one knows from experience, I have been lucky enough to be able to do this kind of run, not, not this drama, but this sort of run, many times over the last five years. And it's rather the... Um, uh, exception if things do go completely without a hitch. They do sometimes go completely without a hitch, but usually there's a difficult decision somewhere or other to be taken about something or other. You are aware, presumably, that there are 800, 1,800 pints of beer on board. Well, that would be very helpful for us, <laughs> great comfort. <laughs> <laughs> that might be, that we might be very glad of that. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> and I think she'd probably run very well on my nail. <laughs> Steam going. Yes, it was something about a steam train that it had its own pers each engine had its own personality, you know, and you don't see that with the diesels. We sir regard railways both in the museum the historical sense and the modern sense. And while we regret the My little boy sees a flying Scotsman. Never seen a steam train. Mad about trains. Does he know it's the flying Scotsman? Yes, oh yes. What's the train called? No. Well, I think uh, from time one is a little boy right on to manhood, uh, uh, a train and railway uh, has always got uh, uh, a fascination. And I think today to know that uh, after uh, 40 years, 
uh, we're still able to do this uh, journey of nearly 400 miles non-stop. I think he's still part of that fascination. non-stop that was the main object of the exercise to do it without stopping and although we had just one or two very very close calls got down to walking speed once or twice we did in fact achieve it without stopping at all and uh, I think we got here just about 30 minutes inside the old 1928 timing literally with a lighter load but uh, anyway it's pretty good I think with an engine now 45 years old when she did it 40 years ago she was a youngster and now she's not as young as she was done well over two million miles and uh, I think to have done that run after all those years is really quite an achievement.